Let's right now just get back to Amir Serfati and his message on Saturday, October the 3rd, Israel standing alone. But as I said, the well-being of Israel was deterred by their lack of faith. And you read in Deuteronomy 28, the blessing and the cursing, the blessing if you follow God, the curses that comes upon you if you don't follow God. But it's your fault. If you decide not to follow him, don't expect his blessings to follow you. Now, you must understand, God directed nations along the history to help Israel. And for that, they were blessed. They were greatly blessed. Do I need to tell you the great blessing that came upon the United States of America right after you have acknowledged Israel as a state, you recognize Israel as a state on May 14, 1940? You were the first country to do that. And needless to say, these were the greatest years of the American economy and the American foreign diplomacy. You basically did receive a few years earlier the baton from the English and from the British, and you moved on, and you took it to greater places all around the world. You were indeed blessed because that was the principle of Genesis 12, as we learned yesterday. God will bless those who bless Israel, and God will curse those who curse Israel. This is a given. If you come to Israel... <laughs> I always take my people and I show them the border on the Golan Heights and with Lebanon. All I need to tell them is whenever the green stops, that's Syria. Wherever the green stops, that's Lebanon. You can clearly see visually where the blessing stops. And then when we drive along the Jordan Valley, people tell me, but wait a minute. On the Jordanian side, it's green also. And I said, yes. But it wasn't green until Israel signed peace with those Jordanians. And now we are having peace with them. And not only peace, the Jordanians are going to be opening their doors for the fleeing Jews from the horse of the Antichrist. So Jordan has to be blessed if Genesis 12 verses 1 and 2 is indeed true. And we see that. As a deputy governor of Jericho and the Jordan Valley, I had many talks with my Jordanian counterparts. And one thing I asked one time a Jordanian general is... Why aren't you having a much heavier military presence along the border with us? And he said, because you're not the problem. In fact, the strategy of the Jordanian army is to have our back to Israel and face the east because from the east, the evil is going to come to Jordan. They know that and they understand that we're not having any aspiration to take over Jordan. We are friends with Jordan. We have peace with Jordan and Jordan is greatly blessed as a result of that. But you must understand, people are looking and thinking, wow, America has lifted its support from Israel, so what's going to happen to Israel? Israel probably is going to collapse. That's the end. Well, I want to tell you something. The concept of Israel relying on another nation in order to survive is an insult for God. That's why He designed us to stand alone. And you see that in the 8th century BC, in the book of Isaiah, you clearly see when Sanchariv, the king of Assyria, was coming to attack Hezekiah the king, he sent his spokesman, Rav Shakeh, who spoke fluent Hebrew. And the guy was standing on the walls of Jerusalem and basically trying to tell the people of Israel that it's for their own benefit to surrender and walk along and work along with the Assyrians. And he said in chapter 37, in 36 actually, verses 18 to 20, he says the following thing. Be aware lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying, the Lord will deliver you. Has any one of the gods of the nations delivered its land from the hands of the king of Assyria? Just the next chapter in verses 21 and on. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Because you have prayed to me against Sencharib, the king of Assyria, this is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. Who have you reproached and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted up your eyes on high against the Holy One of Israel? You see, you cannot mess up with the Holy One of Israel. And look what he told him. Towards the end he says, Because your rage against me and your tumult have come up to my ears, therefore I will put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips, and I will turn you back by the way which you came. So it's important that you understand, God does not want Israel to rely on anyone else but him. Not on Egypt, not on America, not on Europe, not on any world leader 
or country. And even in the 20th century, when he brought the Jewish people back to their land, it was done solely by him. If you just join me, I am playing a message this weekend given by Amir Sarfati, Understanding the Times, 2015, October 2nd and 3rd. And uh, Amir is an Israeli. He electrified the audience with the fact that, well, quite frankly, he feels America has dropped the baton for the world leadership, and there are terrible consequences to that. And one of the worst of those consequences is the fact that Israel, of course, is now completely alone. However, God has not abandoned her, and God will use this position of isolation and alienation for his end-time purposes. Back to Amir Sarfati. My grandparents survived Auschwitz in Poland, and when they survived Auschwitz, they kind of found their way to Italy to board the boat and to start a journey to the land of Israel. You would think that the world after the Holocaust took place after six million Jews were brutally murdered and, and, and annihilated, not by their own people, but by, by Europe, not by other Jews, you would think that the world will be so compassionate and help them. But when my grandparents saw Israel, the British police stopped their boat, turned it around, and sent them to another detention camp in Cyprus. And that's where my mother was born. You see, the return of the Jews back to their land was with no official international assistance. Not at all. Nowadays, Muslims are being killed by their own brothers, by Muslims. And the whole world is mobilizing itself, taking them, putting them on trains, putting them on boats, giving them houses, everybody. And you see the difference between the way they treated the Jews, even after the Holocaust, and the way we see things right now. In Ezekiel 37, the Lord said, I will bring you back to your land and the nations will see that I am the Lord. Even the elimination, and we heard that in the last message, the elimination of the regional existential threats, namely the nuclear reactors that were around us, it was without official international assistance. We had to deal with that all alone. You know, in 1981, when, when we sent our almost entire Air Force on the mission to destroy the Iraqi nuclear reactor that was about to become active days later, did you know that the American administration imposed sanctions on Israel? Did you know that you wouldn't even sell a spare part for our F-16s? And what, the, and you know that you actually said, how dare you use American aircraft? Well, we don't have Jewish ones. But America did not help us. In fact, we did not get any help. We had to take care of ourselves. And in 2007, when we launched our satellite Amos, Amos, for the first time with unbelievable cameras, and we got the first pictures from the Syrian desert, we saw something very disturbing a building that was not there before. We immediately suspected that something fishy is going on. We could see movement of trucks from, from the port in Tarsus all the way to that area. When we inquired through our third party, we were told that this is a, an agricultural farm. So we sent several farmers <laughs> to Europe in order to visit a, the head of the nuclear program of Syria in his hotel room. He wasn't there. So we just borrowed his laptop, and when we returned it, it was with a nice little Israeli chocolate. I mean, come on, you have to be polite. <laughs> Once we got all the data from his laptop, it was evident there is a nuclear reactor built right below our nose, right there in the Syrian desert. We had to send more farmers now to the Syrian desert, and we landed them with helicopters. They were on the move for two days in the Syrian desert. They got to the area, they scooped some of the samples of the soil, we brought it back to Tel Aviv, and it was just evident that there are traces of uranium right there. We asked help from the White House. At that time, the White House said, we cannot help you. We have already enough on our plate with Iraq and Afghanistan. The last thing you needed is now Syrian front. So we had, again, to do it all by ourselves. We sent our F-15s, and we created a big parking lot in the middle of the Syrian desert. Now, if you're asking me if we can do the same now with Iran, we learned that with the Iranians, better to send an email than an F-16. An email with several attachments, little worms. <laughs> if it wasn't for that cyber warfare, Iran would have had a bomb long ago. 